Hi, my name is Dr. Kate Crowley, Professor of Practice here at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. We have spent the last few months busily creating videos uh, and showing the research in a series of videos on how to do culturally responsive, ethical, and linguistically responsive speech-language disability evaluations. Um, we're going to share some of those individual videos of clinicians, administrators, and lead SLPs to show how they, in their work, have changed the practice to be more ethical, culturally responsive, and linguistically responsive in our disability evaluations. This one is Julie Smith. She is a doc student here at Teachers College Columbia University. She also is a bilingual Spanish-English clinician who worked in preschools in New York City and worked very hard to move the clinical practice, and you'll hear what her strategies were to make that happen. My name is Julie Smith, and I am a bilingual Spanish-English speech-language pathologist and doctoral student at Teachers College, Columbia University. My clinical work involves conducting Spanish-English bilingual speech and language disability evaluations. I primarily work with preschool-age Spanish-English dual language learners, or DLLs. DLLs are a highly culturally and linguistically diverse population. I've evaluated a mix of simultaneous and sequential DLLs who speak a variety of Spanish and English dialects. In Northern Manhattan, I've worked mostly with speakers of Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Mexican Spanish. Upon entering the field as a master's student and clinical fellow, I noticed the widespread use of standardized assessments. Many of the IEPs on my treatment caseload were based primarily or entirely on standardized test scores. And across workplaces, it seemed to be the default procedure for diagnostic evaluations. Given the lack of research evidence supporting the use of standardized assessments and their role in the disproportionality of DLLs in special education, I saw an acute need to shift this longstanding practice. However, I was weary of how challenging this could be. Change often creates friction. And with the amount of paperwork that all educational professionals are responsible for, there never seems to be enough time to implement change. Still, ASHA's Code of Ethics prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, culture, language, or dialect and mandates compliance with local, state, and federal laws. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA federal law, prohibits the use of inaccurate discriminatory assessment materials and the use of single measures for the determination of disability status. So in compliance with both professional code of ethics and federal laws, I only feel comfortable using multiple evidence-based measures of language development and disorder, along with my clinical judgment. Because standardized assessments aren't accurate, my evaluations include parent-caregiver ethnographic interviews, teacher interviews, clinical observations in pull-out therapy and push-in classroom settings, dynamic assessment and non-word repetition task performance, and language sample analyses. Figuring out ethical alternatives to standardized assessments was the easier part. Justifying them to my colleagues and superiors was more daunting, however. But I found a way to make change a little easier for my audiences. Following the writing advice of one of my clinical supervisors at Teachers College, I aimed to package my rationale in a concise and precise argument. I knew I had to be brief enough to get my points across in a short email, conversations between sessions, and at the top of my reports. And to justify significant change to a deeply entrenched practice, I knew that these had to be direct and provide an unequivocal argument for change. I found that the best way to do that was by citing the ASHA Code of Ethics, IDEA federal laws, and the research evidence. However, I also wanted to avoid coming off as antagonistic because the goal of these exchanges is to foster understanding. So I take special care to use a collegial tone with objective statements and I statements 
that place the weight of the argument on things like the research evidence or my own clinical practices rather than on my audience. Over time, I've refined my disclaimer paragraph, which I put at the beginning of every single report after the section on the child's language background. According to the Federal Special Education Law, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, assessment materials must be selected and administered so as not to be discriminatory on a racial or cultural basis and provided and administered in the language and form most likely to yield accurate information on what the child knows and can do academically, developmentally, and functionally. Currently, there are no standardized tests that can accurately assess language development and disorder in students with this cultural linguistic background. To use standardized assessment scores in this evaluation would therefore be a violation of federal law. IDEA further mandates that evaluations shall not consist of less than two assessment measures or criteria for determining eligibility for special education services. Accordingly, this document reports the findings from an independent clinical evaluation of this student's development in Spanish and English using parent caregiver ethnographic interview, teacher interview, clinical observations in pull-out therapy and pushing classroom settings, dynamic assessment and non-word repetition task performance, and language sample analyses. The first time I had to defend my assessment and evaluation approach was the most intimidating, but I felt strongly obligated to because of the ethical and clinical values of our profession and the skills and knowledge that I had learned. Now I share this story to show that change is possible. With this approach to change, I've been able to adhere to the best practices for assessment and evaluation of language disorders in my culturally and linguistically diverse clients. This approach has also worked with the progress reports on my treatment caseload and has made the process of increasing mandates and discharging clients from services much more efficient. I attribute this to how my justifications have been received by my colleagues. By making change a little easier, I've encountered less friction, more acceptance, and even some praise from my supervisors and special education coordinators. This success has also inspired colleagues' interests and confidence in changing their own assessment and evaluation practices. So change is possible when we can deliver a strong argument for it. This video and a number of others showing our change makers will go together to form an online course available at leadersproject.org that will also be offered for ASHA CEUs. It will be free and you will meet your ethical and culturally responsive requirements.